I was advised by a New Zealand PhD to investigate Jim Murray's obscure patent. The PhD worked on a government-funded study that came to the conclusion that Murray's technology was the only thing being worked on that had a chance to be a viable free energy source. The alternatives had minuscule power potential, were pure fiction, or just plain fraud. Subsequently, some of today's pulse technology might be added to the viable list. Using time switching, like used in electronic ignition systems, yields a COP of about 1.6, but that seems to be a barrier discovered on many fronts. Murray achieved a COP of 1.84 that was validated in an independent test facility. I contacted Murray to learn that he had all but abandoned the project because he too had hit a wall. Murray's incredible invention is impractical for many reasons. I can list the reasons, but after each one I must add, nonetheless, the inventor proves the generator can have a COP greater than one and nobody has done better. Most interesting is that Murray achieved his unsurpassed COP by using an inefficient rather than an overly efficient energy conversion. He never violated any laws of physics he only took advantage of the valid laws that we all must deal with. The invention is an impractical device, but it is undeniably a pioneer technology that could lead to a solution to energy problems. My initial assessment clearly underestimated its potential four years ago. Murray achieved a COP of 1.84 with what seemed like a crude device, so I thought it must be easy. Now I am only jealous that someone else found the needle in a very large haystack. The invention is effectively a mechanical full-wave rectifier. It is special because with rectification comes a phase shift that produces the COP. The output coil does the rectifying and the rotor's perpendicular forces, like a gyroscope's perpendicular forces, enhance the COP. The wall that Murray ran into might be knocked down with a different coil. Murray's rotor shifts the vector direction of shear forces that produce undesirable torque burden. Axially directed vectors can produce no torque. This conceptual illustration changes the output coil and uses permanent magnets instead of field coils. It is different from typical motors and generators because it is a three-dimensional compound reaction. As such, it is difficult to ex explain or model using two-dimensional FEA. The best explanation may be two-dimensional, using a typical motor as a starting point and showing how it would evolve into this version of Murray's technology. Here we have a two-dimensional, typical DC motor made impotent by moving the coils from the rotor to the stator. DC motors exhibit reversibility, so they can also be used as generators. Motors produce torque with Faraday forces and are inhibited by back EMF or lens force that govern a motor's speed. Faraday's forces are good stuff for motors while lens forces are the price that needs to be paid. The opposite is true for generators. Impedance come from Faraday's forces being moved from the air gap to the steel and lens forces lacking changing flux as the rotor turns. Flux in the air gap would be constant, but still have the same flux gradient as a potent motor. So we only want lens forces in a generator, which means we want constant reluctance. A simple task. Intersecting rotor and stator areas and gap are held constant, so the reluctance remains constant for the motion shown here. A keen eye might notice a subtle but significant difference between these coils and the coils on a typical motor. With no current in the coil, this motion would encounter little resistance and generate an AC voltage across the coil. Adding a load resistor would induce currents into the coil and raise some enigmatic questions. The system still lacks potency to produce retarding forces. How can any torque be produced on this or any passive rotor? The small angular displacements illustrated produce only small voltages. Murray succumbed to the temptation of increasing the voltage by extending past the bounds and increase COP. 
This is not exactly what Murray did, but it does illustrate the point. Voltage is greatly increased by increasing the angular displacement. Faraday's forces kick in due to changing reluctance that occurs when the rotor passes the stator. Net power increases because of mechanical advantages from perpendicular forces, but at the expense of the ever so important COP taking a plunge. Murray never produced more than 50 watts, and his patented invention's economic potential was probably no brighter than $50 per watt. The grim reality of the problem is that a one-year ROI requires a cost of about $2 per watt. Is that possible? Probably not. But a two- or three-year ROI is considerably less of a challenge. The question here should be, how can it possibly work? We have been told since about the third grade that it is impossible. Johnson and Murray and all the other contradictory stuff must be tricks. Maybe the stuff just doesn't meet the Magellan challenge of $2 per watt. All motors of this type, alternators with nearly constant rotor flux, can be characterized by the gap energy versus the phase. Motors of this type have constant gap energy without a resistive load. DC motors increase the energy in the air gap per the physics of a Faraday reaction. Energy above E0 is converted to mechanical work. AC induction motors have a passive rotor, so the gap energy cannot be increased, and the phase must change. Murray demonstrated several things. He proved that a lens force generator would not change phase, voltages could be generated on a passive rotor, and he showed three of the secrets to make it all happen. He may have shot himself in the proverbial foot by trying to explain his discovery with vague assertions about energy resonance rather than conventional physics. Having a passive rotor and no phase change, a lens force generator must have a reduction of gap energy at zero degrees. Gap energy is decreased and permanent magnet potential energy is released. Maybe Murray was right about the resonance after all. I'll just say, the gap energy needs to go somewhere, and the load resistor seems to be the only likely place. I call this the second step. The first step was to find the keys, and Murray beat me to it. Understanding is the second step, which involves looking behind the doors that the keys unlock. I have taken a peek, and I see wonderful things. Murray's technology needs to be optimized to see if it can meet the Magellan challenge. Some of the obvious optimization has been touched upon or suggested by illustrations presented here. This effort at the second step is likely to end up more obscure than Murray's patent. Murray may or may not get the credit he deserves. In any case, I hope I get a little credit for giving the second step my best shot.